<clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, today is the, the 11th of June, uh, 2022, and uh, we'll uh, present the work of this uh, important uh, German architect, Joseph Paul Kleichwitz, uh, who died in 2004 and was born in uh, 1933. So let's read a little bit about him. Uh, Joseph Paul Kleichwitz was born on this day, and that's the reason we talk about him today, on the 11th of June, 1933, and died in August 2004 in Berlin. Was a German architect most notable for his decades-long contributions to the critical reconstruction of Berlin. His design approach has been described as poetical rationalist. Uh, you know, uh, poetic rationalism, what could this be? Uh, similar words had been used like lyri lyrical functionalism. He was indeed uh, uh, rather functionalist and a rationalist, but with a twist, so to speak. So there was always something else there, a little, you know, a little change to the system, so to speak, which made uh, the critics describe him as a poetic rationalist. I think any architect uh, who deserves the name of being called an architect, a he or a she, in order to, to, to deserve this name has to have some kind of a poetry in his or her projects, his or her buildings. And uh, what could that mean? You know, in what way architecture can be poetic? Well, you know, first we should ask ourselves, what is poetry after all? What does it mean to live poetically under the sky or poetically on the earth? What does that mean? Perhaps it means to, you know, to allow emotions to uh, emerge and manifest themselves. In essence, I think it's about imagination, about emotions, about the soul. In other words, a rationalist architecture that is also poetical is an architecture which is not born exclusively from the brain. It's not just the result of calculations, but is also the result of an emotional, emotional involvement of the author, of the architect, with uh, whatever is to be done, with whatever is to be built. And I think it's very, very important indeed <clears throat> not to neglect the poetical side of architecture. And again, Frank Lloyd Wright was right. This time he was right when he said, a great architect is a great poet. Yes, even if he or she doesn't write poetry with words, but he or she writes poetry with materials, with uh, wood, with steel, with glass, with stone, with bricks, and so on. So let's see a little bit uh, the works of this uh, German architect, whom I had a chance to uh, uh, see live in a conference at uh, Columbia University in New York uh, many years ago. And uh, I even wrote a reply to his lecture called Apropos of uh, Joseph Paul uh, or Paul Kleich's um, uh, lecture. Whoever is interested to, to receive it, uh, please uh, write to me and I will send it uh, to you. So Professor Joseph Paul Kleichus, indeed he was a professor. He looked like a professor, he acted like a professor and he built like a professor. But uh, a professor with, uh, who also had uh, that um, uh, poetic persona and that poetic persona is what makes an architect a good architect. Um, so he was German, so he was very rigorous, but he also searched for freedom. And in essence, poetry has to do with freedom. You know, you cannot have poetry without freedom, although you can assume a very rigid uh, a formal con construct or construction of your poem, uh, be it architectural or linguistic, but in essence, you aspire towards, um, towards poetry. And we are going to see uh, particularly a building that he built in Berlin, which illustrates this, I think, rather explicitly. So Professor uh, Joseph Paul Kleichus, 
uh, and uh, yeah. So let's start with this work from 1969 to 1980. Uh, it was uh, uh, an early work by, by, by him. You, you remember he died in 2004. Uh, it's 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 a drawing. It's a project, but um, it says something about him, you know, because it is. It seems to be, you know, rational, but also has, uh, you know, deviations. In a way, poetry has to do with being deviant. Poets poets usually are deviant. Uh, that's why perhaps uh, God punishes them or the devil by giving them the shortest lifespan. Maybe you know, but poets live the shortest. They usually die young. Many poets. There are very rare poets who live, uh, you know, to to old age, as opposed to architects who have an incredible longevity. At this very moment, there are very important architects who are over ninety. Many of them, and um, you know. <laughs> Uh, poets, on the other hand, you know, sometimes they die in their 20s or 30s. Uh, very rarely you find a poet who lives to, to 90 or so. Uh, the building uh, is interesting, though, even uh, by the standards of today. You know, it's, um, it's uh, you know, a 50 years old, more than 50 years old building. It has glass, but it has also uh, rhythmicity, and it has um, uh, vertical uh, pieces of glass. And then there are the solids, the little towers, if I can call them so, which maybe con uh, contain the staircases. It's not bad. You know, it's not bad. Maybe it's not very unpredictable, but it's not, it's not a bad building. Uh, and even seen from this side, uh, you know, it almost looks like uh, it could be some kind of, a, you know, palace or culture palace or uh, the workers palace. Well, it's not. It is some kind of an industrial building. You see with the, you, you, we see those um, uh, vehicles in front of it, maybe some kind of a delivery uh, or storage, large space or whatever, but it has dignity. It has nobility, even if the function is prosaic uh, from this image as well. You know, this is not a building one uh, could pass by without uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, a slight uh, gesture of uh, being interested in. It's quite large, as you can see, it's, 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 uh, it's an industrial building. Uh, what is this? I don't know German, unfortunately, from 1975 to 1981, some kind of a centrum, which is a center, and it does look like a center, perhaps too much so. Uh, fortunately, it has some beautiful small trees in front of it, which bring uh, the necessary disorder of nature, if I am to call it so. But the building, I mean, even this part of the building is a complex. Uh, I think it's okay, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's rational, but it's not oppressively uh, rational. And again, the participation of the ivy, the climbing, uh, you know, plant uh, adds, uh, adds to the poetry. And also it adds, like this building, for example, I, I actually like it. It reminds me of the early works of Miss van der Rohe before he moved to the United States. And uh, I think there is a, almost a, you know, a certain romantic quality here at work. It's, it's not a rigidly conceived uh, work. And it's possible, yes, that um, Joseph Paul Klaikus was inspired in a way by the early works of Miss van der Rohe, those that he built in bricks, using bricks. But even here, where he doesn't use brick so um, opulently, uh, you look at the, you know, metal and glass part of the building, and I think it's uh, well, uh, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, done. It's 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 uh, it's not obsessively horizontal. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of the glass part, you know, like the dogmatic uh, horizontal uh, glass band that the modern is promoted. Quite the opposite. It, it has uh, verticality because of the mullions. 
and I think it's 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 bad. It's 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 uh, it's, uh, it's sorry. It's 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 a good example of a work which is rational, but not rigidly so. I actually like more his early works, like these. We are going to see also his later works, but these early works of Joseph Paul Kleifis, I think they are good, and I think they 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 stand the test of time. And I also think this is in part, at least, because of the uh, participation of the of the you know the the masonry walls, the brick walls, which uh, bring some warmth warmth to the to the whole building. But even without them, the building, because of its emphasis on the rhythmical uh, vertical parts because of the malians, of course, uh, again, uh, of, the, of the glass partitions, uh, is, uh, I think is pleasing uh, visually. Now look here, you know, again, this is a work that um, shows skill and shows a degree of freedom and a, a degree of uh, even playfulness. Yes, with cubes, but it, there is still some kind of a, uh, playfulness is it's not very very rigid. Uh, what is this? 1984-1985. Ah, the Karl Dreieck uh, Berlin. This is the building actually I was uh, uh, I was uh, referring to when I mentioned uh, earlier that I wrote an essay about him. Uh, so he built this between 1984 and 1995. And I remember and I remember when he lectured at Columbia University in New York, he did show uh, this building and he mentioned Josephine Baker, the explosive uh, uh, black dancer who took Europe by storm and who made even uh, Le Corbusier and Adolf Loos kind of fall in love with her. When he created, when he made this piece above, which is actually moving, uh, uh, is, um, he made a reference to Josephine Baker meaning he made references to da a dancer, to dance, to the freedom of dance, to the beauty of dance. Now, it is a little bit big, it is, but it is his idiosyncratic and iconoclastic way of kind of opposing to the cubicle, you know, uh, attributes of the building below, something that uh, proclaims something else, a different spirit, the iconoclasm of poetry, the iconoclasm of freedom, the iconoclasm of flying, you know, and, uh, and, and of movement. So I guess he needed the mobile part to, um, uh, you know, uh, complement uh, the static, uh, you know, the passivity of the, of the, of the building below. Uh, the building below is well built, as you can see, the structure is very well done and even interestingly to an extent, it's still a rationalist building, but the thing, the capricious thing at the top, and I don't know what its function is actually, is this one here, uh, I, I imagine this uh, uh, company paid for, uh, you know, pays for, uh, paid for it and pays for it or, or is rented to for advertising. I don't know. But this capricious thing at the top is actually making the show, so to speak. Of course, architecture is not just a show, but, but we all like interesting buildings. We all like uh, buildings that have something different, something uh, even exceptional, hopefully. And this is what uh, Professor Joseph Paul Kleikus did in Berlin. The building is still gray. The building is still cubistic. It's uh, cubical. It's rational. It's rationalist. But that thing at the top shows another side of Professor Joseph Paul Kleikus. And, um, you know, I guess, you know, this is like, uh, you know, the, the feather at, on, a ha on, a, on a cap you know, on a, on, on a hat, you know, that, that feather has its meaning and its role. And perhaps we shouldn't forget doing architecture of, of that element, Appar apparently superfluous, but, but there is a need for that. You know, that's why, you know, many hats, mainly in the past, but maybe in the present too, and maybe expensive hats had a feather, you know, sometimes an exotic, uh, an exotic, 
feather attached to the hat. Why? What was the meaning of that feather? I think kind of like the meaning of this piece here at the top of, of this grayish cubistic building. Uh, the plan itself has, you know, a deviation from uh, Cartesianism or rectangularity. So uh, it's still a, a kind of an interesting building, intri intriguing building. Um, this, 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 despite the fact that, yes, it is grayish and, uh, you know, uh, based on a grid, this part and with a rationalistic structure, but the structure itself is uh, very rigorously done. It's a fine structure and it's not as simplistic as it could have been. This thing, yes, is a little bit big, actually, for my taste, but, uh, you know, it's not really about my taste. It's about, you know, it is a curious thing, you know, when you look at it. I mean, it's tall, uh, several floors high, you know, and uh, I don't know what function it has besides rotating. Uh, I don't know, in the wind, uh, it's, it's mobile, but uh, it... Uh, it creates uh, the otherness that art is supposed to bring to life and to architecture itself. Now, the museum in Frankfurt uh, am Main, uh, the archaeological museum from 1984 to 1988, and I think um, um, Joseph Paul Kleckwitz was able to avoid the uh, trappings of postmodernism, but not so much in this building. Uh, although he didn't, uh, he didn't make the mistakes that, uh, for example, James Ster Sterling did when he moved from a resolute modernity or modernism into a, uh, you know, ludic but questionable postmodernism. Touches of postmodernism can be seen here too, because it was uh, postmodernism looking nostalgically towards the past and. Uh, uh, many architects had been uh, affected by, by that nostalgia. Uh, I think uh, that nostalgia is problematic today, although in essence, nostalgia is not necessarily a bad thing. It, is, it depends what we do with it. If we don't become trapped in an idealized, uh, in an idealized uh, past, Anyway, uh, what is this? Uh, gallery, Stadtische Gallery in 1986, 1989, and museum. Uh, he built this thing. The museum existed. The, the old museum existed. He built this thing. Uh, it's an octagon in plan. Uh, this building was not built by him. He just uh, did some interventions inside and built that gallery or pavilion outside. This makes me think, of course, a little bit of maybe more than a little bit of Aldo Rossi. But you see, he didn't mimic the old architecture. He still created something new, although, you know, maybe not uh, uh, dramatically new, not dramatically uh, different. Yet there is a difference between this building and this building for all to see. So there is a moving forward on the spiral of time. Um, I guess he liked this kind of structure. And the, even this X, you know, that appears on the elevations, like in the previous building, uh, the X include is, includes the diagonals, the two diagonals, and the diagonals are formal um, acts of, uh, you know, uh, of rebellion in a way, formal rebellion. The inside is fine, it's clean, maybe too clean, but uh, it, is, it expects the art. So it's waiting for the artworks, but the, the building is built, uh, you know, properly, uh, luminously, and, uh, uh, you know, both the structure and, uh, you know, the uh, configuration of the, of the roof show clearly the skill of this uh, 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 German architect. Another building, another museum in, from 1986 to 1989. This was really a difficult period, in my opinion, in architecture worldwide because of the, the manifestations of, uh, uh, of postmodernism. Uh, 
he also he has uh, interventions uh, inside the building. It's an existing building. He didn't modify the exterior. He just has sorry about the resolution of this uh, uh, this of that picture, but this one as well. Nothing dramatic here. Nothing, uh, you know, uh, to to take your breath away. You know, he's uh, he's not a very 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 adventurous architect. But again, I, I like to mention again, I think his early works, uh, because of that use of, of brick and also the, the way he treated the uh, glass and metal um, work on the facades uh, deserve some recognition and even study. Another museum, um, this one I think is not too bad. Um, you know, it's a functionalist work. We see the skylights at the top. Uh, you know, it's uh, probably honestly built and honestly functioning. Uh, what can we say? We had seen buildings, you know, uh, plenty of museums that are interesting. But this is more than interesting. I think it's, it's probably functioning very well. And also uh, aesthetically, I think is, uh, you know, moderately uh, engaging. Joseph Paul Kleichus, Professor Joseph Paul Kleichus. Uh, it's not very, you know, surprising the building and uh, uh, but but uh, it's a small museum which probably functions properly. It's built properly and it, it, it probably has a, a very uh, correct lighting of the spaces underneath. Uh, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Uh, so uh, again, uh, Joseph Paul Kleichus, you see also that he was able to work with uh, uh, with um, you know opaque walls of large dimensions like we see here. So he was not just uh, uh, you know uh, a skillful architect to to employ uh, uh, you know uh, the rhythmicity of uh, metal and glass uh, properly, but also to work with uh, large surfaces of uh, of um, you know opaque walls. Geometry, uh, geometry. I do not know German, unfortunately. So Joseph Paul Kleichus, geometry and poesy. So geometry and poetry. And indeed, if you can marry geometry and poetry, you have a chance to 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 um, you know to do a good work. It's not easy to marry geometry and poesy. And for the Romanians here today, I want to tell you that there was a Romanian. Uh, who wrote a very uh, interesting book, a book that which was known also by Le Corbusier, uh, uh, The Geometry of Art and Life uh, by uh, Matila Gica. So I, I suggest to you to find this book because it's exactly about geometry and poetry. And it was written by a Romanian diplomat and this book was known, I read, by Le Corbusier. So again, it was written by Matila Gica, and uh, the title is The Geometry of Art and Life. Because if you take just the geometry of art uh, is one thing, but to also have the geometry of life uh, is uh, to add something, a complication perhaps, but an interesting complication. Another building in Hamburg, 1988-1989. Here it is. I think he also operated here within an existing building, but uh, I think he did a, a, a good uh, renovation here. Uh, you know, he cleaned up uh, the building, and uh, at the same time, he kept the the vigor of the structure and of the space, and also the vigor of the exterior. Um, uh, you know, appearance of the building. Uh, there is a, a lot to learn actually from Joseph Paul Kleichus about being correct, but also about being uh, an aspirer towards freedom through poetry, through the poetry of building, through the poetry of building in a humane way.
I like that thing there now. Uh, this probably existed from the old building or but uh, you know, it, it's an amusing little uh, ornamentation, so to speak, at the top of the building. So this is a museum, you know, Internationale Kunst, international art. Uh, Joseph Paul Kleichus. And people stay in line before the pandemic, uh, you know, to enter the, the Internationale Kunst uh, you know, uh, gallery or museum in Hamburg. It's a, it's a good old building. He didn't create the building, but he, uh, you know, uh, made his interventions properly within the existing building. He kept the building, uh, you know, with the integrity that it had, and I think he did the right thing. It's a good building. I don't know who built it though, but it's a good building. Okay, another building in Hamburg, another museum, or is it, uh, I don't know, maybe it's not in Hamburg, I see the Hamburger, but that's not Hamburg, it's something in Berlin. Hamburger Bahnhof, a museum für Gegenpark. Uh, it's another museum, I like the structure here very much. Uh, I don't think he, did, he made this structure, or I don't know, maybe he did, maybe it existed. It's uh, again a building that um, I think existed. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's a fine uh, open space for, for art and you can see people enjoy it. It's a, the space of democracy, it's the space of artistic experiments, is the, is, the, is the place where people who are in love hold hands and that's, that's something, you know, uh, if we can make buildings where people, lovers hold hands, I think it's a good chance we made some good buildings. But if we make buildings where, where, where lovers don't want to ha be hand in hand, I guess this could say something that our building is not, not very, very inspiring. Um, yeah, maybe Maybe let's, let's attempt a superficial or ad hoc uh, definition of architecture. Let's say architecture is the art of making a building in such a way that uh, couples hold hands inside and uh, in the proximity of those buildings. What about such a definition? I wonder what uh, Le Corbusier would have thought of this possible definition of architecture is the art through which we make buildings where people hold hands, especially lovers. In other words, buildings which uh, advocate the cause of love. Uh, people, uh, buildings which uh, uh, encourage uh, emotions, feelings, sentiments, affection, love. Anyway, I'm uh, beginning to to uh, perhaps uh, dream a little bit, but uh, I think it's important to dream and I think it's important to, uh, you know, uh, look at architecture also from a metaphysical point of view and not only uh, materialistically. Anyway, I like this building very much. I, I mean, I wouldn't mind at all having the space at my disposal to do some kind of art exhibition here. I like the fact that it is uh, has some Gothic uh, feeling about it because of the structure. Uh, and um, yeah, now I think he did, I mean, even if he didn't uh, create a lot here, but uh, he managed to, uh, you know, uh, respect and, and restore uh, the old building properly. So uh, this also shows a lot of care and, uh, and uh, inspiration and skill as an architect. He didn't, uh, you know, it's very easy for an architect to destroy even a good building if the architect is not very skillful or attentive or affectionate. Now the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, which I saw, 
1991-1996, I don't really like it. I have to confess, in my opinion, is um, it's morose. You know, look at it. It's um, yes, it's the city of Miss Van der Rohe. He's uh, uh, you know, countryman, because as you know, Miss Van der Rohe moved from Germany to the United States and he moved to Chicago and he built many buildings in Chicago. Uh, some uh, famous and even inspired, but uh, this building by uh, Joseph uh, Paul Kleichus, uh, it's um, unnecessarily rigid and it's not. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't find it very graceful, you know, with these heavy walls above, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, the lower part of the building, which has uh, some glass and, but it's, now, if you compare with his early works, I'm afraid this work is, uh, is not as graceful, but there are interesting things inside, like this staircase, which uh, I do like, uh, and, uh, I even wonder exactly how it's going on here, but uh, it's an interesting picture, uh, nevertheless. Uh, and I see there are all kinds of interesting pictures taken of this stair inside. Uh, what can we say? The plan is perfectly symmetrical. As you can see, the sections are as they are. Uh, I still find it stiff. I think he was too much of a professor here, you know. he. He forgot a little bit to be a poet here, I think. He forgot to be a little bit iconoclastic. And I think this is a problem. Well, fortunately, yes, there are these big three letters here, MCA on both sides, which add some drama to the building in the evening. Obviously, the, you know, the management of the building had an, a need to do something with these walls. Imagine the building without these three letters on both sides there luminous as they are, they would have been oppressive and heavy. And we had seen them without the letters and indeed uh, rather oppressive. Uh, like here, even if the building does have some, uh, you know, uh, the poetry of rigor, if, we, if I am to express myself in this way, but it's still a little bit uh, morose for my taste. You know, it is. It's, but fortunately we have art and this is exactly what art is made for, to break the rules, to bring a smile on the face of the passerby, to make two lovers hold hands, something. That's, what, that's why we need art. And uh, if the building is also artistically conceived, all for the better, uh, but, uh, you know, imagine if you remove the art here and here and here, and maybe with this uh, perhaps useless uh, big sphere here, what do you get? You get uh, a building which is, um, I don't know, the otherness of art. Of course, we could uh, envision art as being uh, uh, misanthropic. In other words, to turn your back on society, on the city, and so on. Uh, there are such uh, uh, architectural gestures in, uh, in the field of uh, art galleries or uh, museums. But uh, you see that the, the, the users and the management of the building needed, needed to open up somehow the building somewhere. So, you know, they, they put up these words, we are here or, uh, you know, these balloons or these large spears here, the three letters on both sides. But still, I see more life uh, here, uh, not uh, the architectural life, but the, ar the, the life of the people in front of the building. There is more freedom and life and movement uh, here than, uh, than uh, with the building. But inside the building, we see, uh, because again, if the building is just a background against which art manifests itself, then the need for that rebellious art is for all to see. And that's what we see here. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not an accident that the, that the art inside the building is so baroque, actually. And, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, convoluted. It is convoluted because the building is not convoluted. So we all we all have dualities, right? When the restriction is too severe and the building seems to be restrictive, then you need to explode through something and you explode through art. That's that's what art does. It explodes. It, 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 it art is, is a gesture towards freedom. Anyway, the Regent Be Berlin, Regent Berlin, 1993-1996. So the previous building that we saw is the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, Illinois, the United States. This is an apartment building in Berlin. Uh, when was it built? 1993-1996, so about a quarter of a century ago. It's okay, you know, it's okay. I mean, you know, Berlin has many such buildings, older and newer. It's not too rigid. It would have been more rigid. You know, he played a little bit like here, even in the corner with his, uh, you know, uh, let's call them uh, balconies, although they are very narrow. Um, it's okay, you know. Is it a wow building? No, it's not. And he didn't intend to be, and he's not a wow architect. But again, for me, subjectively, his early work is better. When he worked with red bricks and uh, with a uh, with a kind of a modernism, uh, not too dogmatic. What is this? Something for the TV, 1994, 1996, Deutsche Welle, no pictures, and uh, an aula uh, in Kersfeld, 1995, 1996. I hope I have pictures here now. Sorry. And the Haus Omer und Haus Lieberman in Berlin, Pariser Platz, 1995-1999. I hope I have at least here a picture, and I do. It's this building here, and he built another one on the other side, uh, you know, both sides of the uh, Brandenburg uh, Gate. Um, a difficult context, of course, because, you know, this is a uh, uh, you know, heavily charged um, you know, uh, place in, uh, in, uh, in, in Berlin, historically, po politically, uh, socially. So, you know, this is what it was during the war or after the war. It was uh, the disaster of the Second World War. And he, he was commissioned to build on, on both sides of the Brandenburg Gate, and he did. But please keep this picture in mind and please for the rest of your life fight against war we should all fight against war it is unacceptable that after the destructions that took place in the second world war putin attacks now ukraine and creates similar images similar tragedies forget the images this is not about images this is about death and it is happening at this very moment, not far away from where we are. And this is difficult to comprehend and certainly difficult, not difficult, it is unacceptable. Unacceptable. I cannot understand how Russia, which lost millions of people in the Second World War, provokes now another war where already tens of thousands of people died and millions displayed. How do you explain it? How could you explain the fact that humans do not learn? To me, it is un unexplainable. We go to museums, we go to churches. Mr. Putin claims he is a, a, you know, a believer, a churchman. He is in good relationship with the with patriarch of Moscow, Kirill, you know, and yet, he has no problem to start a war, a deadly war, which continues to this very moment, forgetting completely the tragedy of the Second World War. I do not understand. I cannot understand. So this is the building by um, uh, Joseph Paul Klechus, and he built another one on the other side. I guess this one might be by him too. It's again a difficult context. This was not a place to invite, uh, uh, you know, Frank Gehry to build some of his extravagant structures. 
Although, you know, in a more extravagant state of mind, maybe that could be like a mental exercise uh, possibility too. Anyway, Kleichus was one of, one of the rebuilders of, of Berlin. He was commissioned to build these buildings and he left them, uh, you know, uh, without too much uh, uh, emotions. In fact, in fact, uh, the reticence of the buildings do send a message, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it is perhaps uh, appropriate to lower your head and say nothing, although protesting against the war is important. But in this case, the war already took place and in what way can you build in such a place? Perhaps, you know, a certain level of uh, being mute uh, is, uh, is all you can uh, aspire towards or contemplate. I like the details though of the building, you know, it's like in, in the reticence of the building, he's actually showing the skill of his architecture. It's nothing, there are no overstatements here. You know, it's everything is uh, reticently, uh, but qualitatively, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, well done. Uh, and I think in, in this sense, he understood well the context of, uh, uh, you see here both buildings, this one and the other one here, which were built in Berlin in this very sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, uh, urban context and place. Joseph Paul Kleichus, Professor Joseph Paul Kleichus. Uh, the inside though shows uh, even levels of a certain sensuality like the staircase, which is uh, very well done. And also the materials he used, you know, uh, welcoming even the so-called disorder of the ornaments of, uh, of, uh, of stone, of nature. Um, is this marble? It's very possible. So, you know, just like Miss van der Rohe in the Barcelona Pavilion, he didn't say no to ornament, although it's clear we are dealing here with a very, you know, uh, reticent uh, architect. And uh, this is the rendering of what he did, uh, the model, uh, and uh, yeah, a very sensitive place in Berlin. Uh, sorry about this, uh, it's a little bit uh, light, the drawing, but you can see the two buildings uh, built by uh, uh, Joseph Paul Kleichus very clearly here. I would say this is more than just a correct architecture. Yes, it is a correct architecture, but the sensitivity with which he chose to, to remain uh, reticent is to be noticed because in itself has a certain level of poetry, I would say. Now, what is this? Another building uh, in Berlin uh, is this one. Uh, I, I like the fact that he employs vertical windows as opposed to the obsessive uh, horizontal ones of uh, dogmatic modernism. Uh, this, this, uh, this narrow uh, uh, vertical uh, windows and openings on the first floor, I think adds something uh, a little bit uh, different to an otherwise, uh, you know, uh, common scheme, so to speak. I don't know if he did the landscaping in the courtyard as well. Um, it's rather restrictive, uh, but uh, in a Cartesian kind of way, uh, uh, artistic too. Um, yeah, the courtyard of, of the building cos facade we have we had seen. But it does hurt me a little bit to see uh, 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 nature, uh, you know, tamed in this rather rigid way. Do we see here geometry and poetry? I don't know. I think I see more geometry than, than poetry. But uh, with an exercise of imagination, maybe there is a, a slight uh, 
poetry here too, very slight. Uh, I, I, I personally, temperamentally, I'm a little bit against this kind of uh, segmentation of, uh, of nature and, uh, you know, incarcerated, uh, incarc incarcerating grass and plants and thus nature in, uh, you know, little rectangles and so on. Uh, the army of grass, it doesn't sound good and it doesn't look good for my taste. And, and, the, and the, the elevations of the building are, uh, you know, depressing in their greatness, in my opinion. Another work in Potsdam, 1998, 1999. This is um, uh, an interior design in an existing building, I think, for something for the army, as, if, as it is obvious. Um, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, uh, art and the army, uh, although sometimes uh, interesting works are done for the army, uh, like uh, the chapel that SOM built for the American, uh, uh, you know, uh, airspace, uh, uh, you know, uh, army, uh, and uh, also a beautiful small synagogue built by Tzvi Hacker in Israel for the, the Israeli army. But here, you know, even the display is so militaristically irregular, you know, and I don't know, it's not my taste. But, but, but finally I can breathe. The beauty of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, elements of nature, you know, the, uh, they, they, they soften the image of uh, what we saw there inside. It's as if nature is telling us, please, you human beings behave, be kind to each other, you know, be gentle, stop the war, stop, uh, take off the uniforms, uh, take uh, take um, take a breath and uh, and uh, hold hands. You know this is the beauty of nature. You know, and this is this is what art is supposed to do too. Uh, but what can we do? You know, I guess we cannot live without armies. We cannot live without uh, uh, military equipments, and tragically, we cannot live without wars. Uh, so I look at a building which was existent. I look at a tree, I look at another tree, and I look at this piece of water with these uh, randomly floating uh, uh, plants. And I love what I see here. You know, uh, the building is too rigid and too almost pompous and too uh, authoritative, too authoritarian in its symmetry and uh, rigidity and what is inside. It's a palace, it's an old building. He didn't build it, but um, I'm sure he, he could not have, uh, you know, become uh, Dada inside, you know, like, like uh, iconoclastically uh, other or saying no, he couldn't do that. Uh, I understand, but in a strange way, the building is not so rigid towards outside. I mean, it has, it has a certain softness, you know, uh, it's, it, touches of, uh, you know, uh, small touches of kindness. Museum of whatever that is, art, of course, 1998, uh, 2000s, um, again, Bart Skunst. Um, I don't, I mean, yes, it could be this way or it could have been another way. I look at the old building and he built this one in contrast with the old building, I guess it's to an extent okay, but it's so blunt, this, um, I don't know, uh, like we saw in the museum in Chicago, he exactly there where he would have the chance to assert or uh, underline or even amplify the feeling of freedom that art generates, he becomes a little bit uh, misanthropic and morose. I think, and a little bit stiff. Uh, the inside, I don't know what to say about it, you know. I mean, I, I would question the blueness of the floor. And um, yes, I would invite some graffiti artist, maybe drunk, to splash some colors on those white walls and even on the windows. That's what I would do if I was in charge of this museum. 
Here, yes, of course, you can contemplate the art, artworks, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, uh, well uh, distanced from each other, and uh, the space is luminous, and uh, all the rest. Uh, the beast, which art is, is tamed. Yes, again, the beast, which art is, is tamed, is domesticated. You know, the artist might have been wild. The artist might have been Dionysian, but here on this wall, it's uh, is uh, is calmed down, is contained, is framed. So the beast is um, uh, much less dangerous, if at all. The building towards the outside again, an existing building. He didn't build it, but uh, yeah, I don't. Anyway. What is this? And I, I can read German and I should learn German, but I know I never will. Um, no pictures. And it's possible we approach the end of this uh, other short presentation on uh, Joseph pa Paul Clycus without another picture. I would be, um, would be uh, disappointed, but it might be that this is possible. But you know what's interesting? I mentioned the word Dionysus, and here I have it, you know? And I didn't know, I didn't look at this presentation in two years or so, because that's when I made it, the Dionysianum in the rain. Uh, here it is. Well, uh, I don't know exactly why that Dionysian uh, derivation, linguistic derivation was there, the building, uh, what can we say? You know, uh, it's a correct building, but uh, I prefer the one on the left, a church, an old church. This one is, uh, I don't know. I find even this lower inferior, uh, inferior part of the building rather pretentious with this, uh, you know, different, uh, ornamental pieces connected like this, you know. I, I think he could have done better. The interior is okay, functionalist. I, I wouldn't call it really poetic or rationalist. It's a, it's a gymnasium, actually. It's a high school. And uh, fortunately, there are students who, I hope they are more free than the building. And uh, they seem to be, you know, uh, enjoying looking through the uh, through the glass although those uh, there are no opening windows um, anyway it, it's a high school that's what it is a gymnasium and here is the the plan i guess what he did is the in red joseph paul clifus Professor Joseph Paul Clycus. Okay, another gymnasium with the running kids. The building is not running, but the kids are running, and that's good. Uh, very narrow, uh, tall uh, space here. Maybe interesting. Um, but what is truly interesting and interesting is the life of the children, you know, the pupils, you know, they are the ones who are alive. The building is not so much alive, but they are, and they matter. And uh, what else can we say? A classroom, like many other classrooms that we had seen, where the students are tortured in the name of knowledge. Uh, another building by Professor Kleichus. I hope another kind of architect will be uh, uh, celebrated tomorrow because he is not one of my favorite architects. He's not uh, an arcade, an, uh, arcade, I guess, in Münster. That's it. No more pictures. Happy birthday, uh, Professor um, Joseph Pla uh, Paul uh, Kleichus.